This evening, I'm going to talk to you about the biblical roots of the priesthood and the Eucharist. I entitled that, The Blood That Saves. Tomorrow, I'm going to do three talks. One is what Catholics believe about the Eucharist and priesthood, just basic beliefs. We can all use a refresher course. You, by the way, you better know this stuff cold. <laughs> and I mean that. I'll tell you why. Do you know why our country is in a mess? I'll tell you why. Because our church is in a mess. That's why. Can I say it any more clearly than that? That's why. The world is in a mess because the church is in a mess. We have been asleep. Not all of us, but many of us. And the resonant symphony of truth has not rung out as it should from the rooftops. Consequently, we have chaos in the world. The biblical roots, the biblical background, the Eucharist and the priesthood, it's kind of interesting. Have you heard the word typology? before you know what that is, biblical typology. It's very, very important. In this presentation, we shall make use of what is called typology. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defines typology as the discernment of persons, events, or things in the Old Testament which prefigured and thus served as a type or prototype for things which are completed or accomplished or fulfilled in the New Testament. The typology of the Old Testament is made clear in the New Testament. And what it does is it demonstrates the dynamic unity of the divine plan of salvation. There is only one word of God, one eternal word, expressed in the Old Testament, expressed in the New Testament, but one word, an integrity, a very, very strict unity. Paragraph 128 of the Catechism says that the Church, as early as apostolic times and then constantly in her tradition, has illuminated the unity of the divine plan in the two testaments through typology, which, dis which discerns in God's works of the Old Covenant prefigurations of what he accomplished in the fullness of time in the person of his incarnate Son. I once got in trouble, can you imagine that, <laughs> by making a rather crude statement, which I am a master of, in case you didn't know that. I said that no rabbi or Protestant minister could possibly teach scripture in a Catholic university. And part of the reason is, unless you're teaching a language like Hebrew. You can certainly do that. A rabbi can do that very well, but he can't teach scripture. Why? Because he doesn't know the New Testament. And you cannot teach Old Testament unless you are very familiar with New Testament. For the Old Testament must be taught in the light of the New Testament. You cannot interpret sacred scripture, sacred scripture anywhere. Old Covenant, New Covenant at all, unless you interpret it in the light of sacred tradition, which they don't have. And you cannot interpret sacred scripture unless you apply the analogy of the faith, which they do not acknowledge. I just gave you two of the three uh, principles you need for the interpretation of sacred scripture. The first is you must read it as a totality, and that's what we're talking about here. Typology. It's a totality. The Old Covenant, the New Covenant is one word of God. Let me read to you from the book of Genesis, chapter 14, 
verse uh, 18 and following. I forgot my glasses, so I'm squinting here. I'm getting old. <laughs> Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now please note what Melchizedek brought out here. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And being a priest of God most high, he blessed Abram, Abram with these words. Blessed be Abram by God most high, the creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who delivered your foes into your hand. Now what did Melchizedek, a priest of God most high, bring out to offer bread and wine? Now that's an example of this typology that I mentioned. That's a biblical type. We talk about type and antitype. Now I'm not going to try to give you a, a lecture really in scripture per se here, but some of these principles uh, are, are very important that you know them. Bread and wine, a priest. Who offered the bread and wine? A priest, Melchizedek. A priest forever. This year, my mother, oh, was right after, right around Lent, after Lent, my mother sent me a newspaper clipping from my home diocese newspaper, the diocesan newspaper. And the headline on that newspaper clipping, which by the way, I looked at it and I, it was splattered with tears, my mother's tears. The headline read, Six priests removed from ministry forever. And the word that leapt out at me was forever. Forever. Many of us priests remember that word being used on the day of our ordination when we were told that you are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. It has been a difficult year, but we'll survive Melchizedek, a type of Christ, the priest. In Malachi, we have uh, reference also to the priesthood. More than one, where Scripture talks about the Old Covenant priesthood or the sacrifices of the, of the Old uh, Covenant being now done away with. The impurity of the sacrifices. And how the priest has to be pure in order to be pleasing in the sight of God. Two things about offering the sacrifice and about the truth. True doctrine was in his mouth. They're talking about the priest here. This is Malachi chapter 2, verse 6 and following. True doctrine was in his mouth, and no dishonesty was found upon his lips. He walked with me in integrity and uprightness and turned many away from evil. For the lips of the priest are to keep knowledge, and instruction is to be sought from his mouth, because he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way, and have caused many to falter by your instruction. You have made void the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Harsh words in the Old Testament. The lips of the priest are to safeguard truth. We have had a veritable catastrophe, an unbelievable catastrophe in the last year, and it was no surprise to many of us. 
I preached all through Lent, as I do every year, and every single place I went, there were a lot of tears flowing. I went to St. Louis, and the priest met me at the airport, and they said, Father, would you address the scandals? There are going to be, there's going to be a large crowd, and many of them are broken-hearted. Could you please address this? I learned a very long time ago, if you deal with a difficult issue, a controverted issue, a painful issue, you are apt to make enemies on the left and on the right. And because of that, many of us don't deal with those things. And the older I get, the more I understand, the more sympathetic I become to it. And to be honest with you, I wish I could get out of it sometimes, but I can't. You have to deal with these things head on. Why is the world in a mess? Because priests are in a mess. Why all the evil? Oh, I'm going, I get right to the point, and I mean it. You may think I'm overdoing it on this. I mean it. As the priests go, so goes the world. <laughs> Jesus Christ gave the church to the world to hold it in being. So long as we are faithful to that mission, we do just that. We hold the very world in being. Another biblical type. The chosen people in the desert, Exodus 17, 8, verse 8 and following. They are about to do battle with Amalek's army, a pagan army. Moses, the leader of the chosen people, the visible head of the people of Israel, like any good military commander, goes up on the high ground. And it says that so long as Moses kept his arms outstretched in prayer, the battle went well for Israel. But Moses, being a man, grew weary. His arms began to droop. And then the battle went badly for Israel. Finally, Aaron and another attendant had to prop Moses' arms up so that he could keep his arms outstretched in prayer, whether, we, whether he's tired or not. Keep him up there. And Israel won the battle. Now this also is a biblical type for the church. We have grown weary of performing our mission. We have grown weary of virtue. We have become worldly in many cases rather than holy. I remember very well an intervention during the Second Vatican Council pointed out by the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen. He was there. It was the Bishop of Bruges, Belgium, who stood up and made this intervention. He said, brothers, we are discussing the church and the church being open to the world. Aggiornamento. It is good that we are open to the world. We should open the windows, let the fresh air in. That's good. But I'm telling you, beware. Beware on this point. The world as the theater of redemption is good, very good. The world as creation is good, very good. We must be open to this. But the world as a spirit is not good. Be careful that you do not confuse the spirit of the world with the world as creation or the theater of redemption. You see, 
to try to mix the spirit of the world with the spirit of God is like trying to mix fire and water. The best you can hope for is a smoldering fire. And if you're not careful, you'll extinguish the blaze altogether. And so it is. We weren't careful. And we ended up with a lukewarm spirit, sometimes a completely worldly, secular spirit. Holiness evaporated. Not completely, of course but in many places and in many ways. Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. The chosen people in captivity to Egypt. Cruel slavery. People cry out to Moses, who is a type of Christ. Moses is a mediator, right? Moses were, the people would always cry out to Moses. Moses would go to God and intercede for them. That is a type of Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. And so the people cried out to Moses who took their plea to God. And God said, tell the people to take a one-year-old lamb. From the sheep of the goats, a male, and slay it as a sacrifice. And they are to take the blood of the lamb, and they are to put that blood on the lintels and doorposts of their homes. And that night I shall send a destroying angel. And that destroying angel shall strike down the firstborn of man and beast alike in all the land of Egypt. But the homes protected by the blood of the Lamb, the angel shall pass over. And so you have the Passover. And so it was. They sacrificed the one-year-old male lamb, either from the sheep or the goats. They took the blood the doorposts and lintels of the house, the destroying angel came, and the firstborn of the Egyptians was struck down, killed. But they were protected by the blood of the Lamb. You see another biblical type. You see the typology. In the Old Testament, they're protected by the blood of the Lamb. In the New Testament, that would be consummated in the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All through Scripture, you see this, this intertwining between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. One Word of God. If anyone were clever enough or intelligent enough, they would be able to show you in some mysterious, mystical way how all of these all of these words in sacred scripture, when condensed, distilled, and synthesized, translate into one only word, Jesus, the Christ, the eternal word. That's what all these words, Old Testament and New Testament, that's what all these words boil down to, that one beautiful word, Jesus the Lord. There was always a priesthood, whether in the Old Covenant or in the pagan priesthoods. We know the various pagan religions, they had priests. We know that in the Old Covenant, one of the twelve tribes of Israel, the tribe of Levi, that's where all the priests came from. An interesting difference. All priests had a similar characteristic. In the Old Testament, the pagan priesthoods, they offered sacrifice. A priest was someone who offered sacrifice in atonement for sin. Uh, they would offer blood sacrifice, uh, a bullock, a lamb, goat, pigeon, something of value. They'd shed his blood 
and that would be offered in atonement and expiation for the sins of the people. Then, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law to deliver from the law those who were subject to it. In the fullness of time, Jesus, the one and only priest, enters time and space. The consummation of the priesthood. We, we had the various figures and types of the priesthood in the Old Covenant, the Levitical priesthood, even we saw the pagan priests offering sacrifices. Now Jesus, the eternal high priest, and by the way, the only priest. There is only one priest. Uh, you will see many priests, ministerial priests here this weekend, thank God. But always remember there is only one priest. I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Jesus is the one only priest. He changed, I should say, he brought to its fulfillment, he consummated the priesthood. Because now the priest offering and the victim offered are one and the same. For the high priest offering the sacrifice is also the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And there you have the essence of the priesthood. It is not presiding, although there is that element, there is that element. The priest certainly is the president of the assembly. There's no question about it. He gathers God's family. Uh, he fulfills that, that function, no question about it. But more than anything, he offers the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, it was a sacrifice of blood. You might say there was a veritable hemorrhage of blood that was offered in the Old Covenant. And yet, it didn't suffice. We needed a Savior. And so the Father, who so loved the world, sent his only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but come to everlasting life. Today we have a lot of mistaken notions about the priesthood, and because of it we have, in a manner of speaking, eviscerated the church of her power. The church ordains a priest first and foremost to confect the Holy Eucharist. The reason that the priest exists, really, the primary reason, is for the Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist is the source, center, and summit of the church's life. I, I remember when I was a young priest, I had just been ordained, and I was in uh, Wyoming. And I was having dinner with some ranchers, and they had a young priest there. And uh, this priest, he, he was a, a very intelligent fellow, and he had quite a bit of education. And in the course of the conversation at one point, he said, I get the, I get the impression that you want everybody to be Catholic. And I said, well, <laughs> he, oh, he was deadly serious. I, I, I get the impression you want everybody to be Catholic. I said, well, why wouldn't I? He said, well, they're all right where they are. Now, I am not going, at this juncture, a certain mischievous part of me would like to hold forth on a certain document that I've seen in recent weeks, but I won't. But I won't. But this young priest said, well, they're okay where they are. And I said, why? I, I should leave uh, my good Baptist brother where he is? He, he doesn't have the joy of the Eucharist? He doesn't know that he has a spiritual mother who's the very mother of Jesus? He doesn't know about the fullness of divine revelation? Why should I be happy if he only has two sacraments and I have seven?
Five of the seven sacraments require a validly ordained ministerial priest. And that's all there is to it. And no amount of wishing can change that. That's the way it is. It is God's plan. The Eucharist, the source, the center, and the summit of the church's life. Think about that. That doesn't leave out very much, does it? What do you have if you don't have the source and the center and the summit? You're impoverished. Now, by the way, some of our brothers and sisters who don't are magnificent. And they do a lot more with less than many of us who have more do with that. And so, with all due respect to our brothers and sisters who I love uh, very much, and I know you do too. But why, if I'm in my right spiritual mind, how can I possibly settle for a, si a situation where they don't have everything I have? I don't understand that. I really don't. And you say, well, they're okay where they are. No, they're not. God doesn't do useless things. The priesthood, absolutely essential. You know, I'm going to make a statement here, and if you get this, the rest of what I say this weekend, won't. you could do without it, as long as you get this and understand what it means. No priest, no Eucharist. No priest, no Eucharist. The last talk in this series is entitled End Game. And I'll give you a little preview right now. You know, the, that term, end game, is a, is a term from chess. Now, I'm no, not an expert on chess, but I know the term. End game. I'm talking about the devil's end game. I'm talking about the most subtle heresy, even beyond modernism. I'm talking about the end game of these times. I'm talking about an attack on the priesthood and the Eucharist. I'm talking about a backdoor attack on the Eucharist. Not a direct attack on doctrine, but a circular attack that comes through discipline. Very, very subtle. Lex orandi, lex credendi. And lo and behold, one day, if we're not in fact praying as we believe, perhaps then they will deduce, well, we no longer pray that way. We no longer make signs of reverence. Perhaps we no longer believe Jesus is truly there in the Eucharist, the end game. A terrible attack on the priesthood in the Eucharist. Why do you think the attack on the priesthood that you've seen this year? You think that's a coincidence at this juncture in history? I tell you it is no coincidence. There is an attack that has been long orchestrated by the liar and father of lies, the murderer from the beginning. It is an attack right at the heart of the church. An attack from within, an attack from without. Very, very well thought out by a master strategist, and his name is Satan. And in the final talk of the series, I'll address that, the end game. But what I want you to do next couple of days, I want you to think about the priesthood. I want you to think about what your priests are worth to you. This past year has been hell for a large number of priests. I travel more than most priests. Over about, I fly about a quarter of a million miles a year. That's a lot of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> Man, when they see me coming at United Airlines, they get a red carpet. They roll it out. 
They wanted to give me stock, but it's not worth anything. I hope they get that straightened out. I don't know if we'll be able to fly pretty soon. But I, I get around. I see a lot of things. I've preached in every state except Hawaii, and I have three invitations sitting on my desk for Hawaii right now. I've preached in all the Canadian provinces except Newfoundland, and I've been invited there several times. I've got an inv invitation on my desk there inviting me to come up and hunt a moose. <laughs> they think they can get me that way, and they probably can. But I get around. I've seen a lot. I've been north to south and east to west inside the Catholic Church. And that's a great blessing, and uh, it gives me a certain insight. Morale in the priesthood is lower than it has ever been in my lifetime, for sure, without any question. You have to do something about it. Now, you, you're the... You're the good guys, I know that. You're the solid Catholics. You're the pillars of the church, and I have the greatest respect for you. You have a job to do. You need your priests, and I tell you something, your priests really need you. A lot of times, it goes right over the average Catholic's head. You know, the Father, he seems to be he's with the people all the time, but you've got to remember, you all go home together. He goes home alone. And if he is not very, very careful, the loneliness can get to him. When a man is ordained, it doesn't somehow change him into something other than human. He's still human, subject to all the same sins as anybody else. So do not be shocked when priests fall and fall hard. Uh, should we be held to a higher standard? Oh yes, we should be. But do not be surprised if we fall. I was talking with my superior in July. He celebrated his 50th anniversary of ordination in our, the first priest that joined him in the Society of Our Lady. They both celebrated 50 years, and I preached at the, at the Mass, the anniversary Mass. The bishop, a wonderful friend of ours, Bishop Rene Gracita, celebrated the Mass down in Corpus Christi, Texas, and I preached the homily. And I noted how, in reflecting back, there were 12 priests who had helped me a great deal in my journey toward the priesthood. Only one of them is left. And they didn't all die. Several of them are gone because of these scandals. That article I read, six priests gone. Now, listen, you know me, most of you do. I am not soft on crime, so to speak, okay? I call good and evil by their proper name. I don't call sin anything other than what it is, sin. In those cases, those priests had made a mistake 25 to 40 years ago. It happened once. It never happened again. And they had 25 to 40 years of productive, fruitful, holy ministry, they're gone forever, and there's something wrong with that. I, I, I'm not saying we, we shouldn't deal with it, we must deal with these terrible things, but we have to look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, that's not to say anything against the bishops, because the poor bishops, God help them. They have the hardest job in the world, and far be it from me to criticize the bishops for anything. But that being said, I'll criticize them anyway. <laughs> Praying for them and asking the good Lord to help them out. It's not an easy, you know, they're between a rock and a hard place. I mean, it's just not easy, let's face it. We've got to pray 
we've got to pray mightily for our priests. No priest, no Eucharist. No priest, no source, center, and summit of the church's life. No priest, the church becomes very hollow in a hurry. The Holy Father tells a story how after the Nazis and then the communists marched into Poland, the priests were persecuted. Notice that whenever a violent dictatorship, whether it's the Nazis or the communists, when they march in, it's interesting that the priests are first on the hit list. Very, very interesting. Not that they're so smart, but Satan is smart. And he knows who to take out first. And don't you think that that's not who's behind it? Because it is. In my era in the 60s, during the Vietnam War, I remember speaking to some of the men in special forces when they came back. They had found priests nailed to the floor of their churches. Hands and feet nailed to the floors of their churches in the form of a cross. They would take nails and pound them into the skull just short of the brain so that it wouldn't kill them but it would call, cause terrible swelling, terrible pain. And they would lie there nailed to the floors of their churches for days and then they would die. The priests, always the priests that the devil tries to take out first. Why? Because he knows where the power is. Second Thessalonians has an extremely interesting passage. Talks about the restrainer, that man of lawlessness. Now I don't get into interpretation of scripture that, you know, what do I know? But I'll tell you, when that passage, whenever I see it, I can't help but thinking that's got to be the Holy Eucharist. That's the restrainer. The Holy Eucharist is pure power. Listen, if you don't believe that, I'm going to tell you how to find out. Got an abortion clinic in your community? Tell you what you do. I've said this many times. You get the closest property you can find and rent it. Buy it. Do whatever it takes, and then you get the bishop to put in a chapel of perpetual adoration. And then you watch what happens. The flames will drive the devil out eventually. It will happen. It has to happen. It's pure power. That's the Holy Eucharist. We believe that in the Catholic Church. Listen, I could spend weeks and months showing you that the Catholic Church, in fact, believes that's where the power is. The problem is there is a gap, a very major gap, between what we profess and what we live. When enough of us, we who are called Catholics, meaning the ones who have the fullness of Christianity, when enough of us Catholics begin to live what we profess, when the Holy Eucharist truly is the very source, center, and summit of our existence, when we put it in the center of our life, when it becomes everything for us. The Eucharist is where we go for strength. The Eucharist is where we go to speak to the Lord, to enter into his passion, death, and resurrection. When we begin to live that vibrantly, enough of us, all of these evils that you see in the world today, these evils will be vanquished. But until we do that, they will not. Now I have said things like what I'm going to say here many times before, and I want to tell you something, they have almost always come true. And it's not because I'm a prophet, it's because I have about that much common spiritual sense. Anybody can come up with this. Now, don't do it. Don't go before the Blessed Sacrament. Don't promote perpetual adoration. Don't promote holiness in the church. 
Let the priests continue to decline in holiness and take their ease. And what happened on September 11th will look like a walk in the park because what's coming will be much more horrific than that. If we do not stand in the gap, if we do not take up the battle cry of the Holy Eucharist, then our beloved country will go down in flames and fire. And I don't ever want to see that because I love my country and I know you do too. And I don't abandon my country in her hour of need. And through indifference or cowardice, I don't fail to say what needs to be said. Rally around the Blessed Eucharist. This is not a mere something. It is a divine somebody. Jesus Christ, true God and true man. When enough of us, when enough of us come to the Lord and fall down worshiping him, offering reparation, thanking him and praising him, then, and only then, will things begin to change. But the way that you will be able to tell that it is not happening is through a trail of violence, war, and unbelievable human suffering. Just watch what happens in the next few years if we don't get busy. And the way to do it is to turn to Mary. Turn to your mother, the mother of the Lord, the mother of the most holy Eucharist. Jeff mentioned about the Holy Father canonizing more saints than anyone. I'm going to tell you a fact of spiritual life. Not one saint who was ever canonized didn't have a tremendous devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Not one of them. Not one. Therefore, get a clue. <laughs> you know, some of these people today, including some of the priests who don't want to allow the rosary. I, I've seen, I saw it once, God help us. The people wanted to pray the rosary and the priest said, oh, uh, get this. Now, he's, he never listened to one of my talks. He said, it's not biblical. <laughs> the rosary is not biblical. It's the prayer of the gospel. The mysteries, right out of the gospel. The prayers, Our Father, Hail Mary, where did we get those? Right out of the gospel. You draw close to your mother, and your mother will draw close to you, especially in these troubled times. I'm going to talk about Our Lady as, as the mother of the Most Holy Eucharist. That, that might sound like a funny title to some people, but we know that the, the Eucharist substantially is Jesus himself. And she's his mother. Uh, you know, I could also put a subtitle on that talk on the Blessed Mother I'll give tomorrow, tomorrow and the subtitle could be, Your Mama Wears Combat Boots. <laughs> and don't you forget it. Your Mama Wears Combat Boots. She is the leader of an army, a tremendous army that's set in battle array, that is now ready to march against the very gates of hell. It may seem like we are outnumbered. It may seem like hell has been emptied, and you've got all the demons in front of you, behind you, to the left and to the right. But I'll tell you what, with Mary to lead you, you can scale any wall. You can knock down any stronghold. So you get close to your mother, and I'll tell you this, your mother will draw you close to the Holy Eucharist. The Eucharist, the power of God, God himself. God bless you.